All right. Welcome to week two. It looks like we're not going to cook to death today compared to last week. Um, as you've already explained, for the lecture this week, we really didn't have a whole lot to do. Congratulations. Um, yeah, exactly. And, um, but now you're going to have the content you need to do lab two. So that's good. Today, we're going to start talking about um, tables and relationships, uh, the different kinds of keys you'll find in a database. We'll define what entities and any relationships are, and basically talk about how to determine what entities, attributes, and relationships are. It's a interesting topic in the sense that it really causes people to have to actually think about what they're working with. Um, I mean, obviously working in computers, you got to use your brain. That goes without saying. It's just a lot of people don't realize just how much thought goes into database design. People say, ah, I'm just going to make a database. Yeah, okay. Go right ahead. We'll see how, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to make a database, and then you're going to be making a database over and over and over again until you might get it right. Um, and the very first step to making a database is actually understanding what the things in the database are and what where they come from. So we're gonna there's basically two parts to this lecture. Um, one is we're gonna be talking about basically what's happening in the database server, and the other part is where does it actually come from in the outside world. So in the outside world. We have a thing called entities. Before we create databases and create tables, we need to understand what the data is. And one of the items, the very important items, is entities. An entity is something that can be readily identified that wants to be tracked by a user or a company or an entity of some sort. Um, an entity class is a collection of entities of a given type. An entity instance is the occurrence of a particular entity. Okay, so regularly, you'll hear the phrase entity. The phrase entity and entity class are interchangeable. Entity instance is not interchangeable. So an entity class is just an entity, just we're using less words for the exact same thing. So, Here's an example of a customer entity, and I'll actually come back and I'll circle back to make it more relevant to you guys. We have a customer entity, and it has certain attributes. The attributes are what describes the entity. The instance, on the other hand, is the actual data itself. So if we were to pivot this to something you guys would understand, here at the school in Access, we very likely have an entity called student, learner, something of that nature. Let's say student, because that's probably what it's called originally. And that is an entity class. It's a thing we want to keep track of. An entity instance is each of you. You are all an instance of a student entity. So the student entity is entity class. The instance is the individual pieces of information. So an entity will have the same set of attributes that describe it, and I'll get around to attributes in a bit, but it has the same set of attributes regardless of what the instance is. So when you are being put into Algonquin's student information system, Access, um, they track very specific things, your name, your date of birth, your address, your phone number, uh, your SIN number if you're Canadian, your you know student visa number if you're not Canadian, it's various things that they track to me. And they'll have this data, all these available attributes for every student, whether they use them all or not, every single student, those attributes are available to them. And each instance of every student will fill in the appropriate attributes as applicable. So odds are <laughs> name, let's go with for a given name. That is one that pretty much is a given across the board. Family name, 
might not be a given across the board because there's some countries around the world where you don't have a family name. Date of birth. Everybody has a date of birth. I hope. Everybody's got an address. Everybody has a phone number. Some people may have more than one phone number because you might have a home phone number, a cell phone number, and a work number as applicable, but not everybody will have those. So each instance may have some slight variations in the data. However, the entity as a whole will always contain the same pieces. So which when people are learning about databases and you're in your first learning, often a lot of the online resources will just refer to tables, table this, table that, et cetera, et cetera, just tables. So the big difference between an entity and a table is when you're designing, you can express the relationship between entities without using something called foreign keys. I'll be talking about those in a bit. So this makes it easier to work with entities in the early design process because we don't have to keep track of all the information. We just need to worry about how things are connected. So if we wanted to go at a very high level, going back to the school example, we have entities for students, entities for courses, entities for professors, entities for, you know, course sections, terms, all that stuff. And we can create the relationships between them without worrying about the nitty gritty details of how it's interconnected. Um, it's a bit like when somebody's getting ready to build something for the first time or you're designing something for the first time. You tend to want to think an abstract first. Think about all the big pieces. You know, oh, I'm going to go get a house built, although that's becoming more and more of a pipe dream for most people. I'm going to get a house built. So part of the sketch will be, I want a three-bedroom house, kitchen, dining room, basement, you know, an attached garage, and you roughly sketch it. You don't even worry about, you know, how it's built, all the building codes or anything like that. You just worry about what you want in general. That's what the entities are. There are things you want to keep track of in general, and we don't worry about the details till later. Which, when we're talking about um, designing, we have a couple of keys. We have something called an identifier. So when we're first starting out the design process, and we're talking about entities, not tables, we are going to worry about identifiers at that point. Those are attributes that can distinguish an entity instance from every other instance of the same type in the database. So for example, if we come in here and we go, okay, students, what would be the identifier for a student here at the college to make sure that you're 100% unique from another person? Yeah, student number. So your student number makes you unique. Because I mean, I've had cases where I've had students in the same class with the same name. Mohammed, Mohammed. I once had a class with four of them at the same time. It was just like one of those semesters. Um, it got to the point where I just called out to them by student number. I gave up trying to call them out by name because there was four people answering every single time I said it. Um, so identifier is a way to uniquely identify an instance of data in a database. So if I look you up by student number, it's always only ever going to find the one student. We're not going to find three or four students. We're going to find the one student. If I went, I want to look students up by date of birth. I can't use that as an identifier because I guarantee there's going to be more than, you know, two people with the same birthday in the school. Um, technically, phone number is not a great one either because there are cases where you got two students from the same household attending at the same time. It happens. So when they were gener creating the student information system originally, they chose to add in a student number. Actually, there's a little more history than that, but we're going to go with that for now. They added a student number so that way they can make sure that every student record is unique. So that is at the design stage during while you're talking about entities. When you're talking about the actual tables, we have something called a primary key. The primary key is the chosen attribute, which is usually the identifier that uniquely identifies each row in the day in the table. So originally when they were doing the initial design, let's say for access and they were designing the students, they would say, oh, we're going to have a student number 
as our unique identifier. And when they started actually creating the tables in the database, they took that student number concept and actually created a, an actual data point of it, like it actually created a field or a column, basically probably called student number. And that is the unique identifier that they chose in the end, which became the primary key. Um, so a primary key is a way of identifying a unique row of data in a physical table, and it can never be null because it has to have a value, otherwise you can't find it. Candidate key. So when you're doing the initial design process, when you are doing the initial design, you're trying to figure out what can make something unique. And if we go back and start looking at 1960 something, early 1970, whenever Algonquin started, I can never remember. And there's this try to decide how we're going to keep track of our students. And they started doing some initial data, database design. And they said, okay, what attributes could we use that could be used as unique identifiers? This could have been anything from SIN number, because when Algonquin started in the 1970s, there wasn't a whole lot of international students. So SIN number was a pretty safe guess. Could have been phone number, because back then phone numbers were pretty darn unique. Heck, you couldn't even move uh, five kilometers away without having to get a new phone number. That's how tied you were to your phone number back in the day. When I moved to Ottawa, I had a phone number when I lived on Carling. When I moved near the college, which is literally a seven minute drive from my old place, I had to get a new phone number because phone numbers weren't portable back then. I know it comes as a shock to everybody now that, yeah, I'm just going to change cell phone providers and the phone, the phone number follows you everywhere you go. But, you know, it doesn't make a difference really anymore. So those are candidate keys. These are things that we could use to potentially uniquely identify someone. As we design a little further and further, we will then choose an identifier out of the candidate keys, and then that identifier will probably become a primary key. So that's the life cycle. So you go from candidate key to an identifier to a primary key. There's just steps. Um, it's just design. Now we're going to get back to attributes. So attributes describe an entity's characteristics. All entities will have attributes. All instances of a given entity class or type will have the same attributes, but the values will vary. Let's go back to our students as our example. So we start listing out all the student attributes that could be used to identify a student. Okay, we've got first name, last name, date of birth, phone number, um, address, email. Now the college, you also get a college email, you get a college username, you get um, a variety of things. So every student has the potential for the same set of attributes. However, the values in these attributes will vary. Again, your name might be different. Your date of birth will definitely be different from other people. Your student number will be different. Your phone number will likely be different. Unless you're actually living with people and you all have the same phone number. These things happen. Um, when, in a bit, I'll show you guys the two different versions of um, conceptual diagrams. And essentially, attributes were ellipses. And nowadays, they use more of a rectangular form. And these are the two flavors of the conceptual diagrams. The one on the left is the traditional one that's been around since the 1970s. The one on the right is one that's become more popular in the last 15, 20 years. Um, they do the exact same thing. There is no difference between them, except in how they appear. That haven't been said. The major reason why the one on the right is becoming more and more popular is that software developers, not you guys, the guys who are writing the tools to create ERDs are lazy and they want to, don't want to have to handle two kinds of diagrams. So they said, you know what? 
we can use the square format because it's really close to the same design as we use for a physical diagram. So we don't need to keep recoding the interface with new objects and new rules and new all this. We have a box and it looks exactly the same whether it's a physical diagram or a conceptual diagram, we just show less information. Personally, I like the format to the left myself. Um, it does make for much busier diagrams, but it also makes certain things significantly more obvious. Um, when everything is in a box, everything is in a box. When you have different shapes for things, you can at a glance identify that, hey, this is a lot of attributes. No, it doesn't have a lot of attributes. This is a relationship. No, it's not a relationship. And the other thing that's cool about the one on the left, which I'll show you guys um, towards the end of the lecture, time permitting, uh, there's actually way more symbols than just a square and a circle. There's different versions of the square and the circle. All right, so identifiers, I already discussed that pretty clearly. Um, there are cases where an identifier is what's called a composite identifier, as in we cannot uniquely identify a piece of information by only a single column. One of the reasons why student number is so great is that it's a single column attribute. We don't need more than that. There are cases where you end up needing more than one attribute to identify something, and those are known as composites. So they're composite primary key, composite identifier. It's made up of more than one thing. A good example of how that is, back in the day, would have been old order processing systems. So a lot of people don't realize what's involved in order processing. So you have an order, and you have things in your order. Pretty straightforward, right? There's order lines. So we have basically have two entities. One's an order, one's an order line. The order lines contains what's in the order. And then you also have products. So you have products feeding into order lines and the order feeding into order lines. The way you identify each row back in the day was a combination of the order number and the product number. Because you can never have the same product twice in the same order. You could have a quantity but you can never put the same product in the order twice. And therefore that's a composite attribute because that particular uh, that particular item is identified by two attributes. So when we're talking about identifiers versus keys, entities have identifiers, tables, once we go to physical design, which you're gonna be learning next week, I think, they have keys. So there's three forms of the um, square entity display. And essentially, you've got the full fat version, like the one on the left where it shows you all the attributes. You've got the simplified one that just shows you the identifier. And then you've got the traditional one, which is just a box with what the name of the entity is. This allows for very simple diagrams, especially the one on the right, um, because the one on the right is really easy to explain to lay people, to a lay person. Um, how many of you have ever had a manager that never actually did the job you do? Because that was fast. And he's like, yeah. Yeah, so some, once you work in, certain jobs after a while, you'll realize sometimes you'll get a manager that's never done the job that you do. And they will have no idea what you're talking about. Therefore, you want to use simple pictures to explain it to them. You don't want to use the complicated pictures. You're going to use the simple pictures. And the, di the item on the right is literally what that's for. So a relational database system organizes data in tables of rows and columns, which in the end, an entity becomes a table, an attribute becomes a column. Um, and when we're talking about instances, those are the rows. Um, basically put, when we also look at rows, they're sometimes called records or tuples. Um, tuples is not a term that's used very much, except in very specific circles. Um, 
by specific circles, I'm talking people that are chasing extra letters after their name. So the ones that are going after the masters, the PhDs, that's when they start pulling out the word tuple. Um, because tuples and records and rows are all the same thing. They just like using, you know, fancy words for the same idea. Um, and columns or attributes or fields, that's pretty much the same. So columns represent categories of data, while rows represent the individual instances. So columns represent attributes. So each column in a table will match the attribute of an entity. Each collection of attributes is an instance. An instance is also known as a row. Um, yeah, then they're structured to store data. They have relationships amongst rows of data. All right. So this is an older slide I have. Um, I should have taken it out. I just forgot to take it out. I used, When it was just me running my labs, I have very specific naming conventions. I expected everybody to follow. I should have replaced this slide with, if you're going to use naming conventions, be consistent. So I prefer these naming conventions, which is known as snake case conventions. So in your Java class, when you're learning about the uh, coding standards, you guys are going to learn about something called camel case, right? That, that word rings a bell, right? Lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, right? It's got humps. It's a camel. Anybody here ever look at Python? What's the coding standard for Python? Lowercase underscores. Snake case. It's kind of funny. It, it's convenient. Snake case, Python. Um, there's advantages to this name convention. Um, so whatever it is you choose to use when you submit your work to your lab profs, just be consistent. Don't, don't have it be a dog's breakfast where sometimes table names are camel case. Sometimes they're lowercase. You know, some of the fields are uppercase, some are lowercase. Just make sure that the entire diagram is consistent. Like you use the same style all the way through. Um, as a person who has inherited databases where every person that ever touched it before me decided to put on their own little flair, on how they decided to name objects, it makes life really friggin' hard when you need to code against it. Some tables are uppercase, some are lowercase, some are caps, all caps, some are screaming, some are, you know, plural, some are singular. Just be consistent. Um, but the reason why lowercase is good is twofold. Not all database servers treat case sensitivity differently. MySQL doesn't care. It is the world's most insensitive database. Everything is uppercase, lowercase, it doesn't care. Strings are uppercase, lowercase, it doesn't care. Oracle lies. Because Oracle will store it the way you wrote it the first time, and it also stores an uppercase version of it. So it actually is case insensitive by every time you try to access an object, it actually changes the object name to uppercase, finds that, and then tells you, oh, that's this is how you actually spelt it originally. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server depends which uh, language you've installed it in. For example, you install it in English, it's not case sensitive. You install it in Cyrillic, it is. I don't know why, because Cyrillic isn't case sensitive. It's just weird. Um, Postgres, IBM DB2, uh, Teradata, and a few others are case sensitive, as in you can actually have a table capital S student and a table capital, a lower S student at the same time because they're different strings. Therefore, if you make everything lowercase, you have less risk of collision. That's why. I recommend it. All right, so here's the alternative terminology. So, the red row is the physical design, right? So a table column row. A, the blue row is the um, conceptual design approach of it, which is a relation, also known as an entity, an attribute, and a tuple. And then in the end, we have a file-based, which is file, field, and record. 
Uh, you will notice often that row and record are interchangeable. Um, column and field are interchangeable. Uh, table and file are not interchangeable unless the person you're talking to is 70 years old. And some of you are probably wondering that's being ageist. No, it's because they probably worked with database systems that only operated on files. So in their minds, a table is a file. So the reason why a lot of these are interchangeable is because originally databases stored each table as a separate file. So it was a file on the disk. Um, there's probably nobody in here old enough to remember a product called DBase. There was a product way back in the day called DBase. That's, you know, the first database I learned when I was in school. And with DBase, every time you created a table, it created a file. So each table was a file. The file would have literally a common delimited columns and then rows of data. It looked just like an Excel spreadsheet on the inside. If you were able to open it and look at the raw file, it looked like a, a kind of weird looking Excel spreadsheet. And since column and field were interchangeable, people just started swapping them out. Same thing with row and record. They basically mean the same thing. Tuple is just a scientific term for those. There are actually more equivalencies than this, but as long as you remember table column row or table field record, you're cool. So here's a couple of sample tables. So if, when we're talking here, um, these are straight from the textbook, these screenshots. And for some unknown reason, the textbook insists on using access to draw these tables because it's probably the fastest route to zero. Um, and you will see there's a few items. There's a student table. You get a student table. And in the student table, there's a number, last name, first name, email address. And then you got a class table, which has a class number, a class name, and a term. It's pretty standard information. Um, different database servers, when they represent the data to you, will show it to you slightly differently. Access is kind of one of the few things that access does well is that it shows. Um, Primary keys is yellow. That's you know one of the few nice features of access. And people look at me when I say the word access and I sound like I want to cry because I do. Um, access is a product that's been dying since I've been working with computers. I went through college and Access 1.0 was coming out and everybody said that's never going to last. Every time they release a new version of Office, guess what's still there? Access is still there. Okay, so relational database products store data about entities and relations, which are a special type of table. Um, a relation is a two-dimensional table that has the following characteristics. And this is one of those things where uh, textbooks and profs and people in the industry will often use the word relation and table interchangeably because they mean the same thing. A relation in a database server is a table. It just so happens that 90% of database products just use the word table. Relation is the phrase for people that like to think they're smart. You know, the ones that like to use big words for simple things. So a relation is a two-dimensional table that has the following characteristics. Rows contain data about an entity. Great, so in other words, we have an entity instance. The rule contains information about that instance. Columns contain data about the attributes of the entity. So each column maps out to an attribute. In other words, in a student table, we'll have a student number column, a first name column, and a last name column. Those will map out to the student number attribute, first name attribute, last name attribute. All entries in a column are of the same kind. That's known as a domain. A, by the same kind, they mean you're not going to put somebody's date of birth in the last name field. You're not going to put somebody's phone number in their date of birth. Therefore, all the data going into a specific column is of the same type. If it's a person's given name, it's just given names all the way through. If it's last name, it's last names given all the way through unless they're from India, then they put in a period, apparently. 
because some people in India don't have last names. Um, each column has a unique name. Inside that table, you cannot repeat the same column name twice. You can reuse that column name in other tables, but within the table itself, each column name must be unique. So first name, you can't have a first name column twice. Cells of the table only hold a single value. Date of birth can only ever hold one date of birth. A phone number column should only ever hold one phone number. A first name column for a person should only ever hold one value. Notice I didn't say one first name. One value, because some people have, you know, complex first names. Mary space and Mary and no space, Mary stash and pick your pick of how they choose to write their first name. It has one value. The order of the columns is not important. The database server does not give two shits what order the columns are in. So you could have a table arranged by first name, date of birth, last name, phone number, email, street address, province, city. It doesn't care. As long as whatever goes into that column is always the same information, it doesn't care what order those columns are in. The order of the rows is unimportant. The database server is designed to sift through this data. So what if we put somebody whose last name is Z before somebody whose first name, last name is A? It makes no difference. The database server will take care of it for you. The order of the rows is not important. And the very last one, which is actually, out of all of this, one of the most important ones that does not sound important, no two rows may be identical. If we have two identical rows in a table, how are you ever going to pick one? You'll never know which one you're operating against because if there's, they're identical. Therefore, no two rows can ever be identical, which is why we have primary keys. Student number, no two students ever have the same number. So this is an example of an employee relation, also known as a table. <clears throat> you have employee number, first name, last name, department, email address, and phone. When we look at this, every row is an instance. Every intersection of a row and a column has only a single value in it. Therefore, this is a proper relation because it follows the rule of the first name, column has all the same kind of information. Email address has all the same kind of information. The intersection of a row and a column only ever has one value. Thus, this is a proper relation. This is not a proper relation. Why? If you look at it, you'll have phone number with multiple entries at the same time for a given row. So row 400 has three entries under phone. The rule to be a proper relation is there can only ever be one value at a given intersection. Therefore, actually that's stuff I teach in like week five, but it's, it has to do with normalization. Way later, you're gonna learn how to fix this mess because that's just terrible. So keys, we already talked about keys a little bit. A key is a combination of one or more columns that's used to identify a particular row. Did a pretty good job clearing that one out. A composite key is a key that consists of two or more columns. Um, a candidate key is a key that determines all the other columns in a relation. In other words, a candidate key, which we're trying to pick something, you identify something, we can use it to de determine all the other columns. Um, a primary key is when the candidate key is selected. There's only ever one primary key per table. It can be a compound key made up of multiple columns, but there's only ever one primary key. Um, and I just literally said what that last one was. It's either a single column or a composite. So we're back to our student class and grade example that we had before. And primary key I explained. I haven't talked about surrogate keys yet. Um, so in this example, student number and class number or our surrogate keys. 
A surrogate key is a primary key is a primary key that was automatically assigned by the computer. In other words, it has no real world meaning. It's an auto increment. It has significant advantages over traditional primary keys that use real world real world information. Um, one of the big perks is that it literally has no real world meaning. Therefore, it never needs to change. It used to be that you're in Canada, your SIN number was a pretty safe identifier until all this wonderful identity theft started, whatever it was, like 15, 20 years ago. Like there was always identity theft, but it's gotten very bad. And people actually get new SIN numbers now. So your prime, if you're using your SIN number as your primary key and your SIN number changes, Anything that was connected to your primary to your SIN number is now invalid. Um, and one of the things about a primary key is that it's never allowed to change. So if your entire system is based on the fact that a SIN number can never change, and then your SIN number changes, bad design. You're you're in a bad situation. Um, so those are surrogate keys. They're they're automatic. A good way of thinking about how they work is. Uh, how many of you in the last month have been somewhere where you had to take a number to wait your turn? A few of you, right? You know, you go to the Service Ontario because you need to redo your driver's license, get a new health card. You get, need to get a number to get in line to talk to the financial aid office, whatever. You pull a number out of a spool of numbers. That never, number can never be reused because it's been taken. Surrogate keys work the exact same way. It gives the number away once. It can never be reused. It's a good way to visualize how surrogate keys work. Um, in the bottom one, you'll see there's a grade table. We'll get back to that example later, but it's saying, hey, on the grade table, it doesn't, how do we know what grade belongs to who and for what class? We have no way to know. Uh, we're going to address that in a bit. Um, there was no way to know what the grade belongs to. Um, I've already discussed this ad nauseum, so I'm going to skip this slide. So when you are talking about primary keys, when you're choosing a primary key, there's a few basic rules. You want to keep it short. Primary keys are used for lookups and comparison. Short keys allows the database server to find stuff faster. Imagine if your primary key was a combination of your first, middle, and last name plus your phone number. And every time you need to do a lookup against the database, it has to compare all that information for every single row. It's a lot of work. The shorter it is, the less it has to compare, the better it is. Um, preference for a number. Numbers are good. Use them whenever you can. Number data types are faster to process than character data types. I'm sure you've heard the expression, computers are good at numbers. Because literally, that's all they know is numbers. Like, when a computer shows you the letter A, it's not really showing you the letter A. It's showing you ASCII code, uh, oh, heck, which one is it? Uh, no, it's not 64. It's not that far down. It's like 21. I know character turns 13. Bell is 9. You know the ding sound? That's 9. Don't ask how I know that. Uh, there's, but for example, your um, if you're French, your C C Z, you know the C with the little tail under it, code 135. Computer knows that's actually character 135. Assuming you're using, you know, a Latinate character set. The problem is that whenever the computer needs to work with that, and you're using letters, it needs to convert everything to numbers compare the numbers, and of course, uppercase A, lowercase A, those are different values. It's extra work to do those compares. On the other hand, numbers are fast because it says, oh, I'm looking for number 55. Well, it knows how far down to go, usually to get close to 55, and then it starts looking from there. Maintain simplicity. Avoid special characters, spaces, 
mix of uppercase, lowercase, as I just said. It just makes it, every time you add one little thing of complexity, you're adding a percentage of work. And we realize that computers are fast, and computers are getting faster and faster and faster. Or actually, that's not true. Computers are getting more and more efficient. Actually, that's a better phrase. Computers haven't really gotten that much faster in the last 10 years. They've just gotten better at what they do. We can't go any faster, so we're going to throw more cores at the problem. We're going to add more threads to the problem. They can do more jobs at the same time to make it look like it's faster. Unless you're playing Starfield, then it makes no difference. Keep things simple. And after the primary key is assigned, do not change it. It cannot be changed. Why? If the primary key can be changed, that means it's, there's a chance it's, it might not be unique. There's a chance you might lose it. Therefore, once the primary key is set, never change it. Which leads me back to using the SIN number as a primary key. If your SIN number changes, you're a mess. A primary key does not allow duplicates or null values. You cannot have two, you cannot have duplicate values in a primary key. That means you'll never be able to find a specific row if you've got it in there twice. And you can never have a null value because the absence of value cannot be found either. A primary key, but a primary key when you're creating the table can be defined at the table level or at the column level. That's for later, uh, but you can define it in either place. Um, which, when I talk about null values here, have they talked to you guys about null values yet? I mean, I, was, I know it's only week two, but have they actually mentioned the concept of null values yet in your programming class? No, okay. Null values is something that the human brain has a hard time understanding. We understand empty. That's not a problem. And I'm going to use my little box here because it's really important to understand the concept of nulls when it comes to databases. Okay. When you define a column or a variable in programming code, it's defined. When it's null, there's an absence of value. Do you know what's in this box? Anybody know what's in this box? It's null, because there's no value. It's empty. It now has a value, because you know what's in the box. It's empty. An empty string, null, is an empty string. A null string is not an empty string. Therefore, can you search for something where you there is no value? It's impossible, because it doesn't exist. There is no value. Whether there is Nothing in my box, or my wallet is in my box, this is a known value, whether there's something there or not. When it's undefined, therefore it's null. Um, I really like students to understand the concept of what the null at this point, because I'll be talking about nulls all the way through during the entire semester, because nulls is one of the nifty things that you can exploit in a database. Um, it's basically saying, I don't know. That's what nulls are for, is when you don't know the value. All right, surrogate keys. Um, we talked about it already on that slide, but it's an artificial column that's added to a relation to serve as a primary key. It's supplied automatically by the database server. Uh, it's short numeric. It never, ever changes, which is an ideal primary key because it will never change. You assign the value. It can never be reused. It can't be given to anybody else. It has artificial values which are meaningless to users. And it's usually hidden on most forms. Like when you load up, um, trying to think of some, man, I was aging myself there for a second. Okay, how many of you know what a forum is on the internet? Okay, good. So it's not a complete mystery. You know when you go to a forum and you look at your profile, does it ever actually show you your unique identifier? like your your ID. Most forum software, at least the ones I've used, don't. You have a unique identifier. It's probably a number, but it never shows it to you. Discord gives you a number. It used to, but that number was only partial number. It wasn't the whole number. It was a partial number. 
things where you do see these surrogate keys, receipts. You know when you look at your transaction number? Or you do an online order from, I don't know, T-Turtle, and you bought yourself a bunch of T-shirts, and you're going to get an order number? Those are surrogate keys that are visible to you. Your brain knows that, hey, this is how I find my order. So your brain is a, giving value to something that actually has no meaning. It's just, it only has meaning to the database where the data is stored. So most forms and reports will often hide that number. Like you, my sales reps at my day job, do you think they care what the unique identifier for a customer is? They just care whether or not they can call them and get more money from them. That's what they care about. They don't care about the number of the customer. They care about the monetary number. Um, so here's an entity called rental property. And the first one has no surrogate key. So the only way we can identify a rental property, and this is assuming it's not an apartment, it's a house, is would be literally by street, city, state, and postal code. So the combination of all those columns would allow you to uniquely identify a property that's for rent. And if, for example, it was an apartment building, you'd actually have to have a unit number on there also. So 123 Some Street, Ottawa, Ontario, K2C, 1Z1. That lets you find a specific property. If we wanted to make it a little easier to manage, we'd throw on a surrogate key such as property ID. And then we don't need to, every time we look up a property, we don't need to look it up by the complete street, city, blah, 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 if we know the property ID. Um, anybody here ever look at uh, realtor.ca, LMS, not LMS, uh, whatever it's called, MLS listings, where you know each house, each listing has a number. So you know, you'll drive by and you see house for sales homes, I'll have the MLS number on it so you can go find that house immediately and on the real estate lookup tools. And that's the idea of this property ID. Um, yeah. So in the first one, without the um, surrogate key, everything that's underlined is the candidate keys. Once we added the surrogate key, you know, the property ID became it. So a composite key is a key that consists of two or more columns and is used as a primary key. So if I go back to this, this entity uses a composite key because it uses one, two, three, four different attributes to uniquely identify something. Therefore, it's composite because it's made up of more than one piece. The bottom one is a single property uh, primary key. So, so far I've been talking about how you can identify a single row in the database. What happens when we want to start interconnecting things? So we have two pieces of data and we want to connect them. And for you guys, there's actually a really good example. How would I be connected to you guys? Think about how the connection could happen in a database. There'd be a course code, but in this course code, you still need some sort of entity that maps everything out. So you have a course, you have a prof, you have some students, there's gotta be something that connects them. So there's, there's gonna be actually another entity that you don't see. And this other entity is gonna have something called foreign keys in it. A foreign key is an attribute or a column whose value is determined by the primary key of another table. A good example of this for you guys would be um, a receipt from Loblaws. Okay, let's go with that example. So at Loblaws, when you buy something or Walmart or whatever you buy, right? You're going to have to buy some bananas. When you get a receipt, your receipt will show everything that you bought. Now, 
whenever you try to return something, you still need to have your receipt. So you need that receipt number provides a link between each of the items you bought and the fact that you bought them. So each item on your receipt also has a matching order ID tied to it. So the order ID, the receipt ID is carried down into each of the items on your receipt. So a foreign key in the reference table is called a foreign key. And the key in the referencing table is called the primary key. So the terminology here is a little strange because a lot of people think of it the other way around, where the child record is referencing the parent record. But no, usually it's the other way around where the parent record references the child, which is why they're using this terminology. Um, so this is usually, you know, parent, child, record. Um, actually, I got to avoid the other phrases now, but yeah, parent, child. Um, the foreign key provides a link between the two tables. Um, it's an attribute of a table that's used to identify the primary key of another table. And we are going, in a minute, we're going to actually have that um, diagram of the student that grades and all that, that, you know, those samples I had earlier. A foreign key is a column or a composite of columns that is the primary key of another table. Um, it's called a foreign key because the value in that column comes from a source that is foreign to itself. Okay. That was a lot of pointless words. So your class registration will have class code, student number, class code, student number, class code, student number. In a class registration, the student number is a foreign value because it's actually being defined by something else outside of itself. That's why it's a foreign key because the value is being defined by something else. Therefore, it's foreign to itself. Um, sorry. Now, there's two relations at the bottom, um, department and employee. So the department has a department name, a budget code, office number, and a department phone. An employee, and the way they describe that this is, this is conceptual, so has an employee number, last name, first name, and a department. It's showing that the department is, the employee belongs to a department, but the value of the department is foreign to the employee because it's defined elsewhere. For example, you get hired somewhere. They're not going to create a whole new department just for you. They're going to assign you to an existing department. So therefore, you are assigned to, say, R&D. The value of R&D, even though you're associated to it, does not come from you. It comes from an external source. Therefore, it's foreign. So that's why it's called a foreign key. And now we're going to get back to our happy little diagram of students, classes, and grades. So if you remember earlier, this bottom one that had grade only had a grade column. And how could we identify who had what grade? If we add in two foreign keys, we add in the student number and the class number. So now we know this student in this class got that grade. The bottom one's going to be a composite key. So in other words, it's a combination of the student number and the class number will give me a grade. So it's a composite key. It's They're both foreign keys. This, is, this actually shows that a foreign key can be part of a primary key or not. Um, so since the student number is the primary key of a student, the class number is the primary key of class, their values are foreign to the grade table, even though their values are being reflected in the grade table. So if we look at the first two rows, we'll have uh, one and one. So we're talking about grades for student uh, Sam Cook, right? So student number one is Sam Cook. And Sam Cook took classes 10 and 40. So if we look up here, that was uh, chemistry 101 and accounting 101, uh, both in 2014 fall. And they got, and Sam got 3.7 and 3.5 in each of those classes. Therefore, we know what grade he, he got based on the combination of the student number and the class number allows us to look up the grade. 
or vice versa, we should say, the grade is identified by a combination of the student number and the class number. That is a foreign key. This example covers, like this one slide covers four concepts in one go. And this is just another example of the same idea. We've got a student ID and a course ID that feeds into a course name, showing there's a relation between the two. The course ID is a foreign key. Uh, this particular design is kind of stupid because a given student can only ever take how many classes? One. Because it's being tied to the student. Um, Okay, that's the exact same thing we had a minute ago. Same one we just talked about. Okay, so a bit of thought process here. How do you know when to use or not use a key? So there was a data scientist called, his last name was Cod. Can't remember his first name. Um, there was another one called Chen. So there's Cod and Chen. Those are the two big, the granddaddies of data science. And According to COD, the rows of a relation must be unique. However, there is no requirement for a designated primary key. So each row must be unique, but technically you don't need a primary key. So the fact that each row must be unique basically says, it implies that a primary key basically has to be created. Um, in the real world, every database table should have a primary key. It happens sometimes that there aren't, um, but realistically, they're all gonna have primary keys. So when do we designate the primary key? Usually we need more information, like it depends on which stage you're at. Now we're gonna talk about relationships. So I think we're almost done also, the slideshow. Not Starbucks, that's disgusting, but it's caffeine. Um, entities can be associated with one one another using a relationship. So when I was talking about the student with the grade, the connection between a student and the grade is a relationship. Um, relationship classes is associations amongst entity classes. In other words, a relationship class maps out to entity classes. So in other words, if we get rid of the word class, we just have entities and relationships. A relationship instance is a specific connection between two instances of data. Once again, if I go back to talking about how you guys are interconnected, you have a class, you have a section. Students are connected to sections. Therefore, each record of one of you being associated to one class is a relationship instance. In other words, it's a single instance of relationship between two different entities. A relationship class can involve two or more entities. It's entirely possible to have half a dozen relationships or more. Um, there's the degree of relationship. So when two entities have a relationship, it's known as a binary relationship or a degree of two. Uh, three entities have a ternary relationship. In other words, you've got three entities participating. And this is when data scientists just threw their hands up in the air and stopped giving it names because in theory, you got four, five, six, seven, and they just said, you know what? We have unary, binary, and ternary, and anything more than that is just lots. So the one at the top is an example of a binary relationship. Employee is connected to skills. In other words, an employee can have multiple skills and the same skill could be associated to multiple employees. So you could have a, an employee who's a master carpenter who, you know, has all the appropriate skills to be a master carpenter. And it just so happens that you have two master carpenters. That means they probably have basically the same skill set. So the same skill could be tied to more than one carpenter and each carpenter could have more than one skill. But in this case, Employee and skill, or it's a binary relationship, isn't it? Because there's only two entities participating. 
The second one is what they call a ternary, where we have a client, a project, and an architect that defines a relationship. In other words, a client has a project that is being controlled by an architect. There, in other words, there's three entities participating, and that's why it's a ternary. Uh, I've seen cases where you'll have a dozen entities participating at the same time. All right, database integrity. So we actually didn't identify the first one, but we did talk about, um, actually, we didn't talk about any of these because the slides are out of order. So there's three kinds of constraints when you talk about databases. You have domain integrity constraint, entity integrity constraint, and referential integrity constraint. Um, the purpose of these three constraints taken as a whole is to create something called database integrity, which means that the data in our database will be useful and meaningful. Now, I am going to define these terms, and I guarantee these are going to be slides about this after, but I'm going to define them now in case they're not. Domain integrity actually mentioned already. That's when you're saying that a column can only ever hold one kind of data. If you're putting in a column for dates of birth, it can only ever hold dates. Technically dates of birth, but dates. If you have a phone number column, it can only ever hold phone numbers. That's known as domain integrity. And entity integrity constraints means when you define an entity, certain things are required all the time for it. So when you're defining a student, we need a student's name, maybe a phone number, probably a bit more than that, but you know we'll say that. Referential integrity means that when you're connecting two entities together using a relationship, you cannot create the child unless the parent record already exists. That's what referential integrity means. So now let's go see how close I was on all these slides. So domain integrity, yeah. So all the values in the column of the same type. I did a pretty good job clearly explaining that one already. Uh, and entity integrity means um, requirement that the primary key must be unique and that it's created every time you add a row. That's a minimum of an ent entity integrity. Um, the phrase unique data implies that this is not null. In other words, it doesn't allow null values. Um, often entities or tables will have multiple not nulls because we require certain pieces of information. And for it to the for the entity to be to have integrity, it means that every not null column is populated. And referential integrity means uh, limits the values of foreign key to those that already exist elsewhere. So if, let's just say I've got a class registry and I'm going to add a student to it, but I don't have a student number for that student. So can I add that student to the class registry if I don't have their number? No. That is called referential integrity. In other words, you cannot add relationships unless the parent source of it, the, ex the foreign source of it already is defined. You cannot create something that refers to something else without that something else already existing. And for those of you that have a hard time visualizing this, would you exist without your mother? Integrity constraint. You cannot exist unless somebody created you. And they cannot create you unless they already existed. Referential integrity. Pretty clear cut example, right? It, whether or not you want your mother to have created you is a different story, but you know, it is what it is. You cannot exist unless you came from somewhere that already existed. Um, it's way better than the example on the board. Um, cardinality. Um, we're actually gonna get into more of this later. Um, but cardinality means count. It's expressed as a number. And cardinality is an odd thing because they make it sound like it's this really complicated concept. But really, there's only two pieces to it. There is a maximum cardinality and a minimum cardinality. Maximum cardinality is the maximum number of relationship instances that can participate. It can have two possible values. One many. In other words, it's either 
the maximum is there can only ever be one or there can be many. The minimum cardinality also only ever has one, well, it has only potential of two different values. Anybody want to take a guess what the minimum cardinality could be? Would you say two? No. Minimum cardinality is zero or one. Zero means it's optional. One means it's mandatory. That's the minimum. The maximum means there can only ever be one or there could be many. A good example of a one to many type situation is, again, let's go back to Loblaws and we're going to go buy ourselves some bananas. And we'll buy some apples at the same time. Each receipt can have one or more items on it. So we've all had the day where we walked into the grocery store and we bought one thing and walked out with one thing. You Can you, the, the reason why the relationship between your receipt and the number of items on it is one to many is each receipt can have one, has a minimum of one item because it must have one thing on it. And it could have many items. So the minimum cardinality on a receipt for each item you put on it is minimum of one, maximum of many. Because can you imagine what the person at the self-serve counter would look look at you as you go in through the self-serve, you walk up to the machine, you go tap your card and you just walk out, you didn't actually buy anything. Therefore, there's a business rule in place that says, you know, minimum one. Things that are optional. Um, so we, the vast majority of this group has bought something from Amazon. So that I know. There's two of you that didn't as of last week. Maybe that's changed by now. When you buy something from Amazon and it has not shipped yet, the shipping method is not set. Therefore, the shipping method is optional. Each item has one shipping method tied to it, but it might not have any because it hasn't shipped yet. So therefore, minimum cardinality is zero, maximum cardinality is one. So then we have parent-child relationships. So in a one-to-many relationship, the entity on one side of the relationship is called the parent, Entity also known just as the parent, and the many side is known as the child entity or just the child. And it's often known as a has a relationship. In other words, each entity has a relationship with another instance. For example, an employee has one or more computers, but a computer has one assigned employee. Pretty straightforward concept. You could have more than one computer at work, like I've got three. But those computers technically belong to me as far as my job is concerned. It's not for, you know, anybody else to use. Um, so the maximum cardinality, just odd the way they've decided to where they slide. Um, because this is actually describing kinds, types of relationships, not maximum. Uh, maximum cardinalities, but essentially maximums is one or many, but the thing is, is that many can be on both sides. So these are actually types of relationships. So you've got one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many. One-to-one relationship means that each entity instance can only ever participate once. A one-to-many is again, like your Loblaws receipt. Each receipt can have one or more items on it. A many-to-many -many relationship is um, a bit like the connection between me and students. You guys have many profs. I have many students. We're not going through the same classes, but I've got two groups of 90 students, and you guys have six classes, so you have at least six profs each, but some of you may have seven or eight, depending on how the labs shook out. That's a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, so an employee to a badge, 
And we can turn this around for you guys, a student to a U pass. Make that pretty, you know, something you guys will relate to. That is a one-to-one -one relationship. Each U pass ever belongs to one student, and one student can ever have one U pass. Straightforward concept. An employee can have multiple computers, but each computer can ever belong to one employee. Employee to skills is a many-to-many -many setup where each employee can have many skills. The said skills could actually be a, belong to multiple employees because you could have multiple employees with the exact same skills. Some employees might have more, some might have less. Some skills might be very common, some might be less common. Uh, those are many to many. Okay, now I'm going to show you guys. When I was talking about the. Um, So when I was talking about the old style of diagram. So these are, this is an entity. So this is a thing. In actual fact, I'm actually going to diagram for you guys how you guys actually end up being connected to me here at the school. To my understanding, I've never actually seen the database. I'll say it out front. I've never seen the database. But based on what I've seen of how the data lives, I have a pretty good idea how I would have put it together. So we have a student. Right, so we have a student entity. We have a course entity. We would have a uh, term. Okay. Um, student course term. Now we will have one last item called a section. And I'm going to create an entity here called section. In actual fact, we need one more. Program. Uh, you guys are CT. Right? CST? No, CET. Or CP. C CET, CST, Computer System Technician. That's not you guys. That's where my daughter is. In. That's where my daughter is. So I know it's not you guys. Um, yeah, so you also have programs. So you got computer programmer, computer programmer analyst, and computer engineering technology that all take this class. So in the end, we had need a way to connect them all. So 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 far, we've got these, these entities. This section is how we intersect. Oh yeah, we're missing something. We're also missing the prof. And technically we're missing the room. <laughs> but we're going to stop there. You, you just see how much... You don't realize just how many pieces of data populate the fact that you're sitting here right now. So a student belongs to a section. A course belongs to a section. The term defines a section. The program defines a section. And the prof defines a section. Now what's kind of cool is in all of these, um, some of these relationships we're talking a student could probably participate in multiple sections. So this is where we can argue is, and we're actually going to, and we're actually going to talk about these symbols next week. But this is just saying that a student, to be a student, must belong to at least one section. Technically, it goes like this, and a section could optionally have um, many students. There actually ends up being another entity involved in this in the end. Um, so this section is one kind of entity. Uh, the prof in the section here would literally be uh, mandatory one, 
no, optional one, mandatory one. Um, so a section must have a prof, but the prof might not be have a section because I guarantee in uh, July, start of July, I don't have any sections for fall. I don't even know what I'm going to be teaching in July. Actually, that's not true. I, in June, I don't know what I'll be teaching in the fall. I find out like last week of June, first week of July, what I'm teaching in the fall. So these are the different kinds of relationships. Um, now, I am actually going to simplify this a little bit, and I'm going to go to a different kind of... Um, is it going to let me pick them all? Delete. Okay. I'm going to put in an entity, and another entity, and one more. So we have an order. Actually, you know what? Since I've been doing Loblaws a lot as my example, let's go with a receipt. Product and receipt items. Here's a good example. Okay, so we have our relationships, and I'm actually going to do my connections the same as before. And what's kind of nifty here is a receipt item is defined by the product and the receipt. These are known as, that's known as a weak entity. I'll actually be talking about weak entities next week. But the cool part about this diagramming tool is that it has the ability to create these. A lot of you guys have probably used something like draw.io or whatever it's called now, uh, diagram.app. Which one? Diagrams.net, they used to be draw.io. Yeah, whatever, or Visio or one of those things. All of those tools are able to do these kinds of diagrams, except they're not designed specifically to, and only to create these diagrams. This has the ability to do all of this. So next week, I'll be going through how to create these diagrams. And I'll be using this tool as my example because it has all the tools. But it, what's cool about it is it allows you to do this. Um, the other cool part about this tool, it's free. So you can sign up save your documents, download your documents, allows you to export your documents, you know. When you guys get around doing lab three, you'll recognize the diagram style, where it came from, this tool. Uh, some of you may have already noticed earlier that, you know, lab three diagrams, that's what I use to make the diagrams. Um, it's by far uh, one of the best tools uh, for that. So next week, we'll be talking about diagramming. That is gonna be basically, we're gonna start drawing pictures. We're going back to like grade one. And you're gonna learn about um, conceptual diagramming, uh, potentially physical diagramming, depending how time per permits. Uh, it's going to show you guys how to create the entities and their attributes, the different kinds of symbols for the attributes, the different kinds of symbols for the entities, uh, and how to draw the relationships. That's going to be the big part of next week. Outside of that, um, that's pretty much it, it for today. Um, as always, wait for my announcement. Lab 2 has been released. I have a question. Yeah, so Hybrid Quiz 1 is being released. I was going to add it to the announcement. Um, hybrid, hybrid task one has been released. You guys have been able to read it for a little bit now. If you noticed last week's announcement that you can read the, there's going to be a quiz being released next week where you guys can start doing the quiz. It opens next week. You will have one week to do it. It's based on the slides. No, no, there's actual hybrid slides. Yeah, yeah, hybrid week one, hybrid, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So yes, it's based on that. 